All right. Remember the last lecture that hopefully you just finished up and we stopped with the ladder of defense production and I told you that the next lecture is going to ruin all of that? Well, this is the next lecture and it's going to ruin all of that. The purpose of this lecture is to look at uh, what Richard Bitzinger talked about in his book Towards a Brave New Arms Industry and really outline that for you to begin um, uh, to, to get you to understand how the common conceptualizations of how we believe that the involvement uh, of domestic arms production, our common conceptualization of it, or at least co common accepted uh, uh, notion of how it occurred, really isn't the case. Because if it was, we would be sitting here in 2023 with a massive amount of countries being able to operate on the bleeding edge of arms production development. And obviously that's not the case. So let's go ahead and dive in and find out why that is. Now, hopefully the graph on the left looks familiar because it was in the last lecture. And if it doesn't look familiar, stop this video right now and go to the last lecture because you're going to need to be able to at least understand how states roll through it from point A to point D and why most states seem to accept that that is common knowledge now. And, um, you know, you can prep yourself for when I wreck your world. Uh, or rather, when Richard Bitsing wrecks your world and says, no, this isn't exactly the case. So the graph on the left is going to be the ladder of defense industry development. Now, this is the commonly held evolution of, 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 of states looking to develop their own industry. They think that if they begin to develop their uh, uh, own small arms, that eventually they're going to be able to develop larger arms, they're going to be able to invest in their own research development, so on, until they get to the point where the U.S. is and they uh, uh, basically make the best of the best arms. and um, all states should basically be equal at this point in time, but that's not the case. So most states engage in developing domestic defense industrial capacity. Um, they've usually followed this ladder of development path. Now, states with promising defense industries in the 1970s through the 90s have yet to develop or gone on to point D. They've really kind of stalled out at B and C. They 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 make their own things. They they may make planes or they may assemble planes and license production and things like that. But very few states coming out of the 70s and the 90s, right? Like there's this plethora of states that could produce their own arms. I mean, you had Argentina that was making their own planes. You had South Africa that was essentially making their own planes. You had Israel who was trying to produce the lobby, which... I mean, was state of the art at the point in time when they were trying to to to, to develop it, but none of those states have any semblance of like those material now, right? They've kind of gone into this niche production, but why isn't the case that states that begin along this production path very? Why is it that they very rarely reach point D? So again, we can look at Brazil, Turkey, Israel, uh, South Korea, and Sweden. Although South Korea has really made some really interesting moves especially in the past five years. They're selling tanks like hotcakes right now, uh, which is really, really interesting. They're, 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 it's huge, huge surprise within the world arms market. Um, I'm really happy for them, and frankly, I'm happy to see another state that is at least on that side of the world that is developing something that can compete on the export market. Um, but I digress. Um, the point, the point is, is that most states seem to lag at B and C. So there continues to be a sizable and fixed, what Bitsinger refers to as a technology lag between first and second tier states. So your first tier states are going to be producing at that D level. Most of your second tier states are along the B and C level. Now, why is that? Well, Bitsinger says, well, it's because this ladder works. It's just we conceptualized it a tad bit incorrectly. Bitzinger begins by discussing these qualitative inputs that may explain why most second tier states don't rise up to first tier states. And he talks about a few of these in the book. Some of the most important are here on the slide. So one is that defense industrial development is constrained by a number of factors. One of them is research and development costs to stay at the technological forefront it's incredibly high. Even if we look at the United States, the amount of money that we pour in to our defense industrial base for research and development is incredibly high. In fact, it's more than any other country could probably even conceivably think to invest in its own uh, domestic defense industry. But the purpose of doing and investing 
that much in research and development is to be able to keep producing weapons at the tip of the spear, not only to keep us secure within the U.S., but it's also because if we're, if we're going to look to, to have it on the export market to offset those costs, I have to put out something competitive that the other countries are going to want. So research and development is key to staying at the top. Even like, let's say that you are state A and you produce the most high tech plane out there and all of a sudden all these countries buy it. Well, chances are, if you aren't reinvesting that money into research and development, you're probably going to drop into a second tier state pretty quickly because another state is going to surpass you because they're going to take a look at your plane. And if they have the money to research and develop, then they're just going to improve on that, right? So if you're developing your own domestic defense industry and you are actively investing in research and development to keep yourself on top, you're going to turn back into a second tier state. Also, importing technological know-how is incredibly difficult because first-tier states put a lot of export restrictions on their goods. Now, working in the industry myself, the one thing that I've come to understand is, is, is that it isn't so much that the U.S. wants to protect the hardware. Sure, we don't necessarily want every country to know how to make a missile nose cone or a nozzle or a blade of structures and things like that. But in our large capital defense goods, let's let's take the F-35, the crown jewel isn't necessarily the plane itself. It's the algorithms and software behind it. We keep that incredibly tightly controlled. Sure, if you sign on to the F-35 consortium like Italy and, and a few other states have, you know, we'll let you build the tailplane structures. We'll let you build the cockpit glass. We'll let you do that. But we aren't going to let you develop the software. Take a look at our source code. That is the main difference between it. Because without that, the plane can't fly. So first tier states understand what critical program information is and they protect it. And they hold it very close to the vest. And that's what keeps them first tier. Second tier states, even if they look to license produce, very rarely the products that they get to produce from first tier states, very rarely are they ever getting the technological know-how behind that product. And because of that, second tier states are often relegated to just being second tier states. And the opportunity to move up to become a first tier is incredibly low. Also, a, another constraint is large first-tier arms markets are closed, eliminating the benefit of cheap labor. Remember, most of the second-tier states do have the benefit of labor being incredibly cheap. But the problem is, is even if they develop their own domestic defense industry and they can leverage that cheap labor by producing a plane themselves, very rarely is a large state like the U.S. even going to be allowed to procure it. Remember, most large states, especially your first year arms uh, production states, prohibit purchasing weapons from other countries if there is a substitutable good within their country. So the U.S., for example, has the Buy, Amer the Buy, Amer the Buy American Act. That prohibits the U.S. defense, uh, well, not, I was going to say the U.S. defense industry, but that's not the right thing. It prohibits the U.S. government from purchasing foreign military goods if there is a similar good being built right here in the U.S. So these very large first-tier arms markets like the U.S., because we have a large military and we have a large amount of procurement, we do not allow or we try to re restrict to an incredible degree any type of foreign country being able to break into the U.S. market. Now, you may say to yourself that I know that Air, uh, Airbus is here. I mean, what the 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 UH-72 um, Lakota is an Airbus pro product. Our military flies it, and Airbus, I thought, was French. Well, Airbus is French, but the reason why they also, why the U.S. military bought it is because Airbus put a landed factory and business here in the U.S. called Airbus USA. Right. Well, I don't know exa exactly if it's called Airbus USA, but it's it's essentially a landed U.S. company um, from France. So Airbus took their stuff, said, OK, I'm going to produce you a helicopter, but I'm going to put everything within the U.S. The interesting thing about especially when companies do that within the U.S. is the critical program information is still incredibly protected. So we may say, OK, um, Airbus will buy your heli your helicopter, but. That software is going to be all ours. So now we can make the helicopter or something else perform much better than it would in its home country. 
right? But the fact is, and I keep going off on a on, on tan, tan, tangents here, but the 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 main thing that I want to put across is that first tier arms markets, which are those markets that have a large mili, military for a lot of procurement, are usually closed off to any external country that's looking to sell a final good. So after Big Singer rolls through some of the constraints um, that second tier arms producers have to deal with, he presents the double learning curve, which is essentially kind of his version of how the ladder of domestic uh, defense development should be, uh, which is going to be uh, on the left side of your screen there. And the reason why this 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 linear progression now looks like a curve is because he explains that moving from C to D is incredi is incredibly expensive because of the amount of money that it's going to take for research and development that has to constantly be pumped back into the production. So for a state to be able to move from C to D, for those second tier arms suppliers to be able to move to the first tier, it takes an incredible amount of money. And in, in in order to stay on top, you have to keep it going, which also explains why so many of the countries within the 70s and the 80s and the 90s that were out there just kind of disappeared from the market, at least as primary or capital uh, good arms producers are concerned. So there's also high cost to enter the market. So notice how it, when we go from A to B, there's an incredibly high amount of cost it takes to get from A to B. Why is that? Because you have to have the industrial capacity. And if you don't, you have, to, you have to invest an incredible amount at that initial stage, which also explains why so many states just don't even bother to enter uh, or, or, or develop their own do domestic defense industry. So again, the high cost associated with moving from the second and first tier can be mitigated two ways. So yes, there's high costs there, but second tier arms suppliers tend to obfuscate or not obfuscate, offset those costs. And one way of doing it is being relegated to an integral supplier role, which is what many states tend to do. So if you're really good at a niche field like software, or like let's say that you're really good at machining uh, airplane wings, then you're just going to rest your hat on that. And that's how you're going to end up making your money. So at least you still have a foothold in the globalized domestic defense industry, you, you just aren't producing everything yourself. But you still have access to technology, just not to the extent that could possibly get you up into the first tier role again. A second way is the involvement in international consortiums or co-production, which is what you're seeing more and more. So for those of you in the industry and those of you in the military, I'm heard you've, I, I'm, I'm, I almost guarantee that you've come across the concept of offsets. And essentially what an offset is, is it's offsetting the cost of a defense purchase. So many times, if you can't get co-production, like let's say um, like uh, with F-35, how we've made a consortium. So we offset those costs and other states that are part of that consortium can produce parts and get some technological know-how. They still aren't allowed to know the software behind it, but they can know the internal structure and the basics of how to build a plane and possibly even engine parts and things like that. Um, but offsets are increasingly required by countries who import a lot of arms. So India, I believe, has a 90% offset rule, which means that if I'm buying a plane, in fact, I think I have a YouTube video attached to my YouTube channel, which goes over offsets in a much larger, probably better, better way than I'm about to go over it. But if I'm country A and I'm trying to import a plane from country B and I'm paying $10 for it, well, I'm going to say that of that $10, $9 of that has to be reinvested into my country. So one way to do that, which many defense com companies do, like Raytheon here in Tucson or Boeing up in Washington and so on, is they'll look to offset the cost. So let's say that we're selling planes to India. Well, the one way to offset that cost is go, hey, I'll let you build some of the wing, or I'll let you build the landing gear, or I'll let you build this and this and this to offset the costs, because now it's going to go, I can buy parts from you, let's say that you're building the wings, I can buy parts, buy, buy the wings to assemble the plane, 
and I'm buying the wings from you and at an incredibly cheap rate, which means ultimately that you're getting a cheaper plane. But remember, if I'm Boeing and I'm doing this, I also think to myself, if India's making me really cheap wings, then I can use those wings not only for my exports to India, but my exports to to anywhere else, which allows me to up my profit, which creates again, which are, which illustrates this very globalized uh, supply chain which that exists within the defense uh, industrial complex. So that's one way that a lot of these second tiers tend to try to stay at least sec- second tier and possibly try to move up to first. Because if I show that I'm a really good partner with the wings, maybe I can coerce you to kind of go, okay, well, let me develop some of the software. Let me develop something a little bit more sensitive that's going to allow me to be able to take that tech into my own industry for my own stuff. The need for technological know-how needs to be transferred. That's the main thing that many of these countries, many of these second tier states need to move into the first tier. They may be able to assemble the planes, but they don't know how to research, design, and develop those planes. And that's what they're trying to look for. But again, first tier states keep this incredibly protected and to a high degree of control. So now that Richard Bitzinger has basically told us in the past few chapters that the plight of the second tier arms producer is probably going to keep being their plight for the foreseeable future and they're unlikely to move up to first tier. What does he say that the global arms production system is going to look like in the next 15 years? Well, he gives us three basic predictions. Number one, he says, because of the incredibly high cost of the domestic defense industry, it's likely to become smaller globally. He says, as worldwide armament production continues to decline and manufacturing capacity contracts, and as most second and even some first tier states abandon certain types of indigenous arms production, the global production system will become smaller. He also predicts that the global production system is going to become more concentrated. And he says that as armaments production is consolidated in the, in the hands of fewer and bigger companies and countries, both in the first and second tier arms producing states, the overall structure will become smaller. Now, we even see this at the domestic level within the U.S., especially past the 1990s. As the Cold War ended and domestic defense uh, uh, spending decreased within the U.S., we saw a massive amount of merger and concentration within uh, the U.S. domestic defense industry. We went from something like... Um, in you know the the I think it was in the 30s of co- of 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 major arms companies in the early 80s down to essentially we're running with about five major arms companies right now, and those companies are buying up other companies to this day. We just had United Technologies buy Raytheon, I believe, in 2018. So we see this at the domestic level within the U.S., but don't forget that this is also happening at the international level as well. Lastly. Richard Bitzinger predicts that the global arms production system is going to become more integrated. And he says, as the globalization process gains momentum and as more armaments production is carried out transnationally, dominated and controlled by first tier states, the arms production system will inevitably become more integrated. And we see this going on right now. Remember that this book wasn't, uh, uh, it was, wasn't written this year. It was actually written 2003. So now we can look back with 20 years and test out if some of his assumptions are true. The integration level, we see that many of the major arms producing companies like Raytheon, like Boeing, like Eads, right? Their supply chains are becoming increasingly international. Now, the reason for that partially is because of the requirement of offsets by so many foreign countries like India. If you're going to sell arms in India, you're going to be required to give an offset there. And many times those uh, are related to direct offsets, which means that if I'm going to sell a plane to India, part of that plane is going to have to be built in India. But the nice thing about that, at least for these companies, again, and I, I think I had mentioned in a couple slides prior, is that smaller countries, those second tier states, can leverage those lower labor costs and provide incentives for these domestic defense firms in these large uh, 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 profitable countries like the U.S. to begin to invest in them to create a global supply chain. So if you're buying a weapon from the U.S., chances are 
there is almost no point in time, at least that I'm aware of, that the full system is built here in the U.S., except for our very secret capital goods like the F-22 and things like that. Most of the U.S. defense goods being produced here in the U.S., or you think are being produced here in the U.S., most of those parts are being supplied not from the U.S. And the reason for that, again, is partially because of the offsets. Um, these 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 corporations like Raytheon, like Boeing, if they're looking to sell and they want to sell, they have to provide some type of offset. But this is creating this very integrative global defense supply chain, which is very interesting when it comes to the complications that come from that. So we can even see today with a 20 year look back, you can look at the major weapons being produced within the US and even in Europe and look at the supply chain that are related with those. Most companies like Lockheed actually has with the F-35, um, and I can pull it out and, 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 and provide the link in the description, but they even speak to where all the different parts are made, how you know the whole consortium that bought into the F-35 usually bought into it with some type of offset uh, uh, built into the contract, which means that they're building something that's going on to that plane, and it's creating this international supply chain for Lockheed to leverage that low labor cost, which also brings the unit cost of the good down as well, which makes it more competitive on the world market. So now that we know that it's become smaller, more concentrated, and more integrated, what are some of the consequences that come from that? So now that we know that the uh, global arms production system has become smaller, more concentrated, and more integrated, what are some of the consequences that come from that? Well, I just lay out three here, but there are a number of consequences that come from this. Uh, so make sure to read the required readings that are linked below within the description. It goes into depth on that. I only have so much time for each one of these videos. So the three that I chose to look at, um, or rather two, is security and arms control. So from a security uh, uh, perspective, the fact that the arms industry is becoming smaller, more concentrated, and more integrated means that second-tier suppliers may look to export with little regard to security implications due to seeking economies of scale. So remember, as it's becoming smaller and more uh, integrated and concentrated, a side defect of that is it's becoming more competitive. For those second-tier arms suppliers or for those second-tier arms producers that are producing their niche goods, Right? Let's say that we're looking at Turkey with uh, drones. Um, there is a push to lower unit costs, which means that some of these countries may look to export arms for the profit. They're economically motivated to keep their domestic defense industry ru running. So some of the political and security implications of transfers um, you know, tends to not be looked at as strongly as it is with the U.S., so you take a country like France that sees the uh, uh, the um, the establishment and the robustness and the continued success of its national defense industry is pivotal to national security. They've shown time and time again that even in states where the U.S. has balked off from, like e e Egypt and Saudi Arabia. France has dove right in and sold arms to them with little respect to some of the things that the U.S. has issues with, like human rights and things like that. The reason for that is because they see that if they don't sell arms, that their domestic defense industry isn't going to make money and therefore their security is at stake. So some states, especially moving into your second tier states, feel that incredible pressure to sell to lower those unit costs and seek that e that economy of, of scale that first-tier suppliers usually don't have too much of an issue uh, getting. This also goes into the second issue, which is arms control. So what we're finding is, is especially as we're moving towards this kind of hub-and-spoke model, um, where the second tier producers provide uh, parts and, uh, and, and, and assembly for arms that are researched and developed from the first tier, is that arms embargoes are having a very, very small effect and are increasingly, I hate to use the term, but increasingly useless, especially if they aren't going to be multilateral arms embargoes. Um, the reason for that is because an end product good isn't necessarily made in one country. So if there is an arms embargo from one country to another, 
Uh, chances are because so many other states are producing things or can take the labor costs, the, you know, the, let's say, like, I guess the only good way to talk about this is to give an exam, uh, an example, right? So if we take the U.S. for example, um, if the U.S. is making a bomb and we're importing parts for the bomb fins from somewhere else, from some other country, and we're trying to ship them to Saudi Arabia, And all of a sudden, we're importing the bomb fins from Great Britain. And Great Britain says, we no longer want to sell arms to the Saudis. Well, they can say, the U.S. can't really sell arms. And in the old ways, that would just stop the arms sale. But now the U.S. goes, okay, well, we don't have an arms embargo on the Saudis. So let's just find another country that can make these fins. Like we already have this country, you know, country X making fins for another product. Let's just have them make the fins for this and let's go ahead and ship these things out. So arms control becomes a very sticky issue, especially as things are becoming more integrated. Now on the flip side, the interconnected supply chain can also present issues to arms exports from countries. So on the flip side, right? Yes, the U.S. can seek another country to build those fins, but it's going to take time. It's going to take money. What we actually found, especially with the curtailment and the arms embargo that the EU placed on Saudi, I believe in, oh God, I'm getting my ears mixed up. Probably, I think it was 2018. What we found tonight was actually in the industry at that point in time what we found is because the 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 end product because like let's say that we're dealing with the bomb because the fins were made in a country that doesn't want to ship it anymore now all of a sudden it stops that shipment because it's going okay well i i can still ship you the bomb but i'm gonna have to wait some time for those canards or wings or whichever pieces that i was going to import from the eu and no longer can right so there there is an economic risk when it comes to the interconnected supply chain for major companies like Raytheon's, like Boeing's. Um, They have to be aware of different countries and their arms embargoes being placed because it's going to cause a disruption in the supply chain. It may not ultimately stop the sale, but it's going to cause issues with profitability for the company. So it does have an effect economically for those arms production companies. And that does it for week two that focused primarily on arms production. Hopefully um, these three lectures illuminated the arms production system for you. I hope that you do the readings if you haven't. If you just stumbled along this video um, after I had posted it, uh, please take a look at the links below for the readings. And a lot of, a lot of this is going to make a lot more sense and, and probably going to flow be- better in your mind. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Otherwise, I look forward to talking to you guys next week for week three's lecture um, on the course Arming the State.